got a weird one here. You've probably been enticed in by the title. Uh, I am currently in a call in Discord with four other players. Now, I don't really know any of you guys, but you're all wizards with the Guild Wars economy, and you've approached me, and you want to talk about making gold. Uh, one of you is the richest person in Guild Wars. So can I do something very tacky right now just to get everyone excited in the video? MM, how much money do you have right now? And what's your peak? Our peak is 1.7 million with gold. Okay. Currently sitting about like 1.5. So a slight drop, but still a drop in the bucket. Yeah, that's a hell of a lot of money, okay? Most people watching this video probably have never had, like, over 1,000 gold, let alone millions of gold. Okay, the other question I want to ask you is, with how much money you have, do you know who, like, the second best is in terms of, like... Because I'm guessing you you know you're the richest because of Guild Wars efficiency, right? So do, are you, like, a huge step above? Are you just, like... Okay. So there is a, a few people who have hit the million uh, liquid gold mark where they have million gold worth of stuff they could you know trade and sell on the trading post there's one guy who's still active he's actually in our guild his name is schedule um he's worth about close to two million as well wow. there are and there have been other players who have hit two million uh three million who just are no longer playing this game anymore um, and their assets have appreciated over time right so now that if they came back to the game that would be the next competition to beat wow. um and these guys haven't been playing since uh you know maybe 2014 so it's been a while since these guys have played so okay it's a small circle but there's a couple of us in that million club all right so so we're in with the sharks here guys on the video so basically what happened to everyone on youtube is a few days ago mm just out of the blue gave me four legendaries just outright as though it was cool and easy and whatever. And uh, following that, you've basically expressed to me that you and your guild, you want more people in Guild Wars to know how to make more money and do what you do, right? Is it, that's that's the idea here. And that's what we're going to be talking about today, correct? Pretty much, yeah. It's in a sense like um, a lot of people usually get, you know, disheartened, you know, trying to make money in this game or understanding just like, how can I, you know, I have 500 gold. How can I get that to 2000? How can I, you know, get what I want to get in this game? A lot of this is things that people don't notice, but you're playing the game. You are earning money as you're playing the game. You just don't know it. And, you know, that's part of the things that we'll be discussing today, the four of us, and going into details with. Okay, so I've got a question for you straight off the bat, all right? I think intelligent people watching my video right now I think that they're going to be cynical, and I think I think they're going to be wondering, what are you getting out of this, right? I, I think they're going to wonder if you're going to encourage people to touch certain markets and things, and then you flip in, uh, against them or whatever, and somehow there's something in it for you. So, like, it's very philanthropic what you're doing. This is just pure altruism because you feel like you've beaten the game now? Is, there, is, is, this, is this stuff people have to be concerned about, or is it just getting more for all your currencies and it's not necessarily all well, TP oriented. Of course there's multiple benefits and some of it will definitely benefit us. It will benefit, you know, other trading post barons uh, out there. And I'm sure you're aware of some of them who are, you know, moderators on the exchange, big traders who trade on that subreddit that goes to exchange. Um, the benefit though is increasing the wealth in the game. You know, part of the reason why this whole conversation is happening is because We've noticed that there isn't that many, you know, you could call it the middle class of this game. It's kind of missing, and that is what's hurting the game. So, hmm. you know, teaching the players how to, you know, it's not that hard to get a couple thousand gold under your belt, um, go to the trading post, experiment, you know, do your research. That's not, I mean, it's more competition in the market, sure, but it creates other trading partners in the economy, right? Out of a thousand people that watch this video, five thousand, ten thousand. If five hundred players make something out of this video, that's five hundred potential players I could trade with. Zushin, Okami, uh, Red here could trade with. Multiple other people could trade with. So, and that makes a healthier economy because that means more activity is happening in our game. Okay. Right. So, yes, there's a benefit. I mean, I could benefit, right? Uh, that means another player I could make use of their resources but they're also going to make use of those resources, right? So it's a two-way street. Okay. All right. Well, I think that's pretty convincing. So over the next however long this is, to everyone on YouTube, this video literally is these guys 
teaching you how they think it's best to make money and i guess have proven it's best to make money to hold on to money and turn your money into more money in guild wars which i have to say going into this i'm pretty excited to hear because i've never like people who watch my videos know i i don't really uh pay enough attention to this you know i'm the guy that does the instant buys and the instant sells and you know i don't scrounge i've got loads of random economies i think uh, the other day you pointed out the fact to have twelve thousand spirit shards is kind of crazy or something yeah i think that a lot of people are like me that just we could do so much more so i'm quite selfishly interested to hear what you guys have to say i've got to be honest um, well i have uh, to say uh first of all Thank you for filling up my buyer group by selling some of your stuff. So that's <laughs> beneficial to us. <laughs> uh, You're welcome. Yeah, that was definitely doing that for other people. Definitely. Yeah. Uh, I, to give you like a to give you like a rundown, just first of all, just before we dive deeper into this. So the reason being like how we came in here and put together this largest gold making operation in the game. Um, the funny thing is, some of us were competitors to each other. Um, and the benefit we found out was that, well, if we work with each other, at the end of the day, someone has something to trade that I want. You know, I have something to trade they want. Where can we draw a line, make a deal, and make that happen? And, you know, a lot of people don't realize this. And I know a lot of people say the guilds in this game have been ignored. In a sense, though, you see a lot of those successful small communities, they reinvented the game by creating their own content, right? And that is what we created, which fits our model. You know, our model is specifically based on trading and, you know, increasing uh, wealth. That's the goal that our members in our guild have, right? Okay. And that's that's what people are forgetting is it comes down to that. A, a very strong foundation of players with a like-minded goal and are, you know, motivated to actually get what they want to get in this game is what it will take for you to accomplish what you want. Okay, so you're giving me the impression, is what we're about to dive into <clears throat> kind of super specific hardcore stuff that only a few people who really lust for it will want to go for? Or is there a lot of stuff in here as well that will help kind of the everyman as well? There's a bits and pieces and that will account for everyone. Obviously, okay. there's things that are a lot more harder to achieve and that, you know, you'll find the people that really want that type of recognition and that type of uh, mindset will achieve. But for the most part, what we explain here isn't something the average player can do. Everyone okay. here can do that. And I mean, I can give you an, a quick example, which I can toss uh, to Zushin. Um, but Red here, Red has been with us for two months and uh, he didn't, you know, before this, Red, how much was your gold on your account before you met? Um, so back when I first met TP, I'm pretty sure I only had about 500 gold maybe a thousand gold and that's because i had just sold off a a bolt to instant sell on the tp nice you, nice a man you've been man. with us for yeah he's been with us for two months now and what's your liquid gold at now red right now i am at the doorstep of twenty thousand gold whoa wait in two months you've gone from like a thousand to twenty thousand <laughs> yeah it's it's honestly it's a lot from uh listening to Sushin's lectures, um, finding out what I could do with the resources available to me, and the connections that I had. I've been playing in certain places, like I've been doing raids or things like that, and I didn't know that I had so many things available to me that I could turn a profit on and at the same time pay or I guess fuel my, my friends, get the people that I'm playing with they now have a lot of gold too because I've been doing these deals with the TP guild. Dude, that's crazy. I've got to say, guys, I, I'm going into this with the impression that a lot of the wealthiest guys were just like people who really got hardcore with selling raids and just did it really regularly and got money. But I, I'm guessing that viewpoint's going to get turned upside down by the end of this. <laughs> I'm guessing there's lots of other ways to go for it. That's one method of money making, right? And, and actually, we have a raid seller right here and he's actually the leader of one of the raid selling groups in this game where the top of what they do, Kanye kind of right here. Okay. Uh, yeah, so um, going off what you said about uh, like hardcore raid sellers and like hardcore mentality, I think the only person here that has that kind of mentality is, isn't really in the channel. But the 95% of this guild, of this guild uh, they're all like, we love to play the game. We all do fractals. We all go about uh, running around in Wolvie World. Like we do these events and we farm these currencies just as the rest of you and 
uh, like even for myself, I lead and help schedule and help run the Ren Cell team for raids, right? And that's I do that because I love to raid and because I might as well make money doing it. Okay. So that's only maybe five percent of what I actually make. It's oh, wow, like really? over time, good gold. Yeah, over time is really good gold. But when you're looking at uh, producing large or more quantities of gold, like it's just like playing the game naturally will give you the gold. It's just utilizing your currencies and finding the most efficient way to get the most out of it. All right. Well, I think that's a brilliant intro. Uh, if you guys want to roll us through some of the topics, I'm sure everyone's very keen to, to, to hear what you've got to say. Um, who do we want to start with? I, my understanding is... Uh, just so that everyone on YouTube knows, we've, a, each person in the channel right now is kind of an expert or is going to be discussing a different kind of area, right? So it's kind of up to you guys. Where do you want to begin? More or less, we started off, uh, you know, my background is I was a flipper from the start of the game and I worked my way up uh, to get a decent amount of wealth. Uh, and I got into, you know, server politics and World Wars World. Um, and I started a whole legendary operation there, right? You know, purchase people's gift of masteries. You know, make the weapon, sell the weapon, and I would loan a lot of those weapons out to guilds that would want to transfer off the servers, right? And they would pay me back over time in certain ways, which Zushin will co probably cover, and you'll understand what, how I make the money back. Now, uh, pretty much, I met Zushin and Okami as my enemies. They were uh, leaders of the server Maguma, and I was the leader of Jade Quarry. And at first, we were noticing that you know, well, X amount of weapons comes up on the market. Who does this belong to? And we found out, well, why don't we group together and start our operation uh, and merge it together, right? And we found out that that is actually what excelled our money making was coming together as a guild uh, rather than just being individuals on our own. And and then from there, it picked up to where it was today. We, we run about 7 million to 10 million gold worth of deals every year between 160 members in our operation and goes across and it stretches out to about 2,000 to 3,000 people within our reach. So um, wait, what, what do you mean? What do you mean deals? This all sounds very like mafia, very monopoly. I, I, what do you mean? When I say deal, I mean, I'm talking about I have a weapon. Someone has uh, some materials, maybe some precursors, maybe some uh, mystic coin. What I want those materials to make more weapons. They want my weapon to gain gold and capital on themselves to do whatever they want to do, right? So, example, you have, uh, let's just say you have X amount of uh, T6 sets. Uh, you know the, the gifts that you need to make the might and magic for a uh -huh. weapon, right? Yeah, all fortune. So, yeah, so you say you have a couple of those and you're like, hey, MM, I'd like to come trade that. What can I get in return? And I, for example, say, hey, I have a legendary weapon. Um, and you're like, okay, that equals to the value that I'm okay with. Here's your X amount of sets of uh, materials. I give you the weapon. You're obviously going to sell that weapon because you want the gold, right? For something that you want. I'm going to use those materials to make more weapons, of which I'm going to do the same exact deals with another five, six people who I just did the same deal with you. Right. So and what you're saying is actually a lot of this is... Uh not trading post related it's it's specific interactions and deals you strike with individual players we definitely would need to go to the trading post at some time right there's certain things like buy orders that you could only fulfill through the trading post so what we focused on is we created the trading post network within our community right so that any at any given moment if someone wants to purchase or sell something the first people he goes to is the guild which is us because our network there's always someone that might be looking for said item and might want to do set you know the deals that we speak of right and in some cases the trading post acts as a necessity if someone needs the liquidity and capital you go sell your stuff to the trading post right because that's the fastest way to liquidate and, and gain gold right because mm -hmm. you can you can only send 500 gold through the mail so you cannot really eliminate the trading post but it serves as a necessity for certain things. Okay, so is is a is a fundamental part of this the fact that the trading post takes a cut, right? It is a gold sink it, for every transaction, yeah. and the idea is a community like yours is that the priority thing people are looking for a lot of the time, just to avoid that specific tax that's on the TP. Yeah, it's um, so obviously you don't avoid the tax entirely, even when you're trading with people outside the game. You know, you can't deduct the tax because then you know both parties could take a loss right one person on the side would take a loss so 
but the tax is minimized to the point where instead of paying 15%, you're paying less than 10% of the tax, okay, right? Yeah. And, and that comes with, you know, you have to negotiate, right? I want, to, I want to value my item at this price. You want to value your item at this price. And then we come to an agreement where, okay, I'm comfortable with that deal. You're comfortable with that price and we make it happen, right? So yes, in some sense, you can uh, mitigate the taxes on the trading post. Okay, but that's not the main thing at play here that's just like another another facet of it right yeah okay and then yeah this is where i definitely i'd say Zushin, you would come in and explain you know our model essentially what it comes down to is there's assets and you know these are the liquid items that you can trade at any given moment what we do is we trade them around each other right so we're just moving an item from point a to point b to point c which is player right and at some point, some of those assets do go back to the trading post because eventually it does go back, right? Whoever is that person that lists said item. Mm -hmm. um, but we keep it in a rotation. It's a circle. Like the market is our guild. And as long as we keep things in rotation, uh, that is what, what you're accomplishing is avoiding that trading post uh, need to go there. Okay. So you essentially have a guild that is its own trading post. It's like, it's like a competitor to the BLTC almost. Right? Uh, am I crazy? Is this essentially what you're talking about? Uh, you could say we compete in a sense with the. Uh, you bypass. Post. Yeah. You bypass it. Yeah. It's on in this game. You know, uh, to give you just numbers, we, you know, doing about eight to ten million gold worth of deals within our guild organization, even with other individuals that aren't in the guild but are very well uh, connected with us. Um, this only scratches about 10% of the economy, right? Because let's be honest, overall, the output of other, you know, 2 million other players is going to be more than what we generate, right? 10 million gold is generated by the top 1%, and then the other 15 to 20 million gets generated by the overall player base, mm -hmm. you know? So what we do still barely scratches the surface, even though we're the best at what we do and we're the largest of, of this kind. Okay. So it just give, gives you a perspective that, you know, the game is still miles ahead. Yeah, which is why you're happy to do a talk like this, right? Because if you already had a massive, you know, that there was no, there was nothing else to share, then it wouldn't make sense, right? But you're you're talking about there is actually still a lot of untapped potential. Are there a lot of communities like yours then? Or you just describe yourself as the biggest, or is this, you know, very fringe kind of Guild Wars gameplay? Because I've never really come across this in in all seven years. Our model in the TP Guild is probably the most unique one in the guild you'll find. I'm sure people have their own versions, uh, maybe not of our model, but their own version of what they think is the best way of doing what they, you know, the same thing that we do. But our model is definitely unique because our guild doesn't involve, doing, you know, there's a lot of factors that we haven't noticed until the last year and a half, which is a lot of the content, like, you know, going on the maps, the meta trains, you know, it's, it's basically we're playing uh, together, right? You know, squad of, 50 people uh, farming a meta train. Uh, yeah, you know, you go from you know, switch from this map to this map. We found out that you know having a goal where if you want to be in this guild, you gotta strive to increase your wealth and at the same time um, achieve things in the game. You know, you could want armor, you could want a certain amount of AP points. That's all you need to be successful, right? You need people who are motivated for a goal and will actually get that goal done. And when you have a guild of players behind your back doing it, the goal should be easy for you to, to accomplish because you have those people who are also motivated just like you to get what they want. So let's get into uh, Brass Tax. What specific recommendations do you guys have for people? Oh, I definitely, Zushin, this is your time to shine. Okay. Okay, so... Um... I'm going to I'm going to go over how I started out first and what I'm seeing because obviously everything that I give is just my in own interpretation of the economy. But um when I was world v worlding and I was uh, competing against Guild MM in the Jade Quarry server, I needed an incredible amount of gold to transfer guilds and all that stuff. And right. one of the main issues was I had to have market share over the legendary weapons. And through that experience, I identified a very particular weird anomaly that's occurring in the game that completely 180'd my view of how the game structure is that the economy of this game is completely backwards compared to WoW and Final Fantasy XIV. 
Right. Right. So um, the one thing that uh, I've identified is that um, the one commodity that I have plentiful across my entire network on the Maguma server was spirit shards. Right. I had so many people who had spirit shards, but um, when I began making legendary weapons and I was increasing my gold level over time through the increase of mats, I realized I uh, bottleneck myself. I could not continue the money making process without spirit shards because that was the most efficient way to acquire your mats. And that was when I realized that um, not only was XP to spirit shard important, but achievements was also important. And that brought me out of World of World and straight uh, into PvE to establish the operation. And when I met with MM, I realized that as long as I had a trading network where I can get a constant flow of mats combined with the spirit shards, I could create an economic system and invent one from scratch. Wow. And that's how I got into it. And that hooks into some core mechanics that I currently majorly undervalue. Like, I don't really care about. As a player right now, my perspective is that spirit shards are worthless and experience is worthless and that AP isn't actually that relevant. You're telling me those things are relevant for actual big money? As a matter of fact, your Guild Wars 2 Masters Challenge is what actually brought uh, uh, you to our attention because you are actually on the best gold per hour money making in the game because you specifically strive for achievements. So if you open your achievement panel real quick. Right, okay. And you go down to account bonuses. Take a wild guess which one is the most important account bonus in the game right now. Uh, I'm guessing you're going to... Well, oh, I don't know now. I, well, I don't think it's Magic Find. I think Magic Find's always been a bit of a placebo. It's the XP game. XP? Because that's what's ramping out your spirit shards. Because if you take notice what Enid's actually implementing into the game and through their design decisions, you notice that in LS4 maps, they add account bonus XP, right? They right. add food, you know, the ascended food, that plus five universal XP. Yeah. Not from kills, yeah. universal, right? Guild bonuses, banners, everything is ramping up XP because we've, uh, for our TP guild, our major weakness in making money is the acquisition of spirit shards because the moment i deplete my spirit shards i have to rely on someone else to do this for me and i have to pay them for that for that service oh and that's the critical part of our trade network so treat me like a dummy you care about spirit shards because you're tearing for people that don't know on youtube there's a mystic forge recipe or several that allow you to take t5 mats and turn them into t6 mats but it requires mystic crystals and philosopher's stones, right? Is that the underpinning this whole thing? Well, that is uh, the core crux because you can take any item in the game and take the output minus the input of mats and the difference is the value of the spear shards, right? And spear shards quantifies the value of time. However, you have to identify the major problem that we are facing in this game and that's uh, in its economic designs decision, right? Which is one of the reasons why this game does not operate the same way that World of Warcraft and Final Fantasy XIV does. In those two games, when you quest or you kill mobs, uh, you're generating gold and mats at the same time. Not the case in this game, right? Obviously, um, you know, um, I'm not going to say that I can assume what Anet's intentions are with their uh, with their uh, flow system of gold, but when you look at uh, Anet as a whole and you study what they're doing throughout every map of every game, um, I personally believe that they want to control gold to make sure that the value of gold yesterday will be the same as the value of gold tomorrow, correct? Right. They want to make sure that gold maintains a consistent value. However, if you notice from every map generated from Silver Waste all the way to LS the recent LS4 zone, you notice that these zones, when no matter what you're doing, has always generated mats, but never that much gold, maybe triplets of gold, but not sufficient enough to meet with the inflation of mats, correct? Yeah, I always assumed it was they gave you the mats because they wanted you to trade and then the, the TP gets to, to be a bit of a gold sink at the same time. And that's why I always thought right. they went with mats instead. Right. So when you take a look at this in, in general, right? So here's the problem that every farmer faces. And I talk with many farmers because I usually get their input on this. But when you sell your mats to the trading post, you obviously get hit by the 15% tax, right? But here's the problem. We know where the equilibrium is, or at least we try to study where the equilibrium is on every mat, right? So let's take, for example, uh, you know, like a T5 mat, right? So let's say you list a T5 mat at the lowest listing, right? To us, you're listing it, uh, and I'm not going to go into the very technical detail, but I'll give you a, a range of value. That could potentially be 20 to 30% below the equilibrium. 
And worst off, if you sell to the buy order, which could be exceeding maybe 20 to 30 percent below equilibrium, that on top of the tax for every hour you're playing the game, you're losing 30 minutes of your productivity. Poof, it goes out the window, right? Wait, so you're telling me if I have a stack of T5 mats, I sell them instantly on the TP. I'm losing, I'm losing how much did you just say? Like 50 percent of almost. It really depends on where the equilibrium is, and the equilibrium is determined by the end product of where these mats are sunk into, right? So if we use legendary weapons as a benchmark, then you can actually estimate the value of where the T5 mats are when you start to look at the uh, process of making it. So for someone like me, if I know I have spear shards and I can use that to make mats and I can buy order stuff, which I know is below equilibrium, essentially what the, how the spear shard functions is it returns the mat up to its equilibrium as long as you can seek it into an end product that is useful to you. Okay. So, in in essence, if you go into say like uh, powerful blood, for example, so you have fifty potent bloods, you have five crystalline dust, you have uh, powerful blood and half of a spear shard. You know, these things uh, you have to figure out where do they come from. Potent bloods, you have to buy order that because there's nothing in the game that drops it straight up, right? So when you um, when you buy order these and you let's say for example you know you're collecting it in uh below equilibrium essentially what the whole process is is you're turning you're trying to get that back to uh to its equilibrium level by sinking the other stuff in crystalline dust for example you get it from ectos right but we need lots of ectos and most people fail to realize you can make your own ectos just from the normal stuff you salvage. You, you you can get dust dropping. You can get T6s dropping. You're just saying it's so rare we can kind of ignore it. Is that what Because they do get generated straight up by the game, right? It's not all coming from Mystic Forge recipes. You are actively creating these mats and you do not even realize it, right? There are, there are many methods out there where you can take simple mats like silk, leather, mithril, elderwood and turn them into rares as long as you understand where these mats are coming from. And that's what um, we're trying to help people understand that they can develop armors and legendary weapons for themselves to meet their uh, you know, play needs without having to exert so much effort, right? Because if they were to sell all these mats to the trading post straight up and incur almost a 50% loss when they do this, and they have to later go and buy back the mats to create the items. They're just double taxing themselves if they decide to sell the end product back to the trading post again. And you're, to me, that's inefficient. Okay, so you're you're telling people to really think twice before TPing. Try to exhaust the Mystic Forge recipes, tear stuff up <laughs> as much as possible, and put the stuff you generate directly into your goals, and use the TP more as a last resort instead of a first call. That that's right. that's a philosophy. That's cool. Now, I am killing my own market when I say this, but, you know, I am stressing to every farmer that when you look at mats, you need to use the wiki to research where they go into, right? And this is where you want to be with people who can speculate and theorycraft where these mats are going. And this is one of the missing elements of the game, how people can use these mats, get it to a value that everybody can agree with. So let's say legendary weapons, for example. Most people say, they should be at 2,000 gold plus. Others could may say less or more. That's all part of the game. Everybody gets to pick the value, but the consensus of the community sets the prices. Painit has no control over what we do with our mats. Mm -hmm. And we have to decide how we use it. Spear shards, in my opinion, is one of the most uh, difficult commodities to acquire because we have to trust people to make stuff for us because we just don't have the play time to meet the demand that we have on our side. So you're saying you have such a throughput of items that you're trying to tear up. You can't do it on your account anymore. You don't get the experience. It, it, it doesn't come in fast enough. So you have to give T5s, T4s, whatever, to another person, hope that they tear them up, and then you're, you're hoping to get the tiered up materials back. And you're paying them for spirit shards, basically, right? Right. And there's I a can trust toss this back to MM about this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. On, a, on a grand scale, like, and this whole comes down to just one thing, right? Is this trust right you gotta trust that said individual will deliver back the items and you go on about your day um but like you know when you see some of those farmers they go like 15 gold i earn 20 gold an hour on silver waste it's just not enough or and most of these farmers are like Zushin said you know they take up the trading post and they're insta sell their, their stuff which this feeds people like me people like other tp barons right um and the, even the ones here okami red and Zushin, and 
you're yeah. not only just you know you're not just insta selling like like you should said like that 15 percent loss because you're also taking the 15 percent hit on the tax so you're only getting taxed you're also losing the potential value of what you could have used those materials for and in Zushin's case you know you could have uh sent them to someone converted them or you yourself could have converted them right and you could have reaped the profit even further right yeah well you know, I, i've got a question for you all then i i think for most people certainly myself I've always had the sense that when I sell to the TP, whether it's a buy order and it's a sell or not, whether I list it, right? I've always had the sense that I'm feeding someone else's wealth there. Someone smarter than me, is, is put, or someone with more time than me is putting more energy in and I'm always losing. I think most people understand that. I think the main thing that people want to be convinced by to get on board with what you're saying is that it's not, uh, it's not that tedious. It doesn't take that long. It's not... You know, the, the scale now seems to be at a much greater degree than I imagined previously. So uh, people are going to be cynical right now listening, thinking, oh, but I don't want to spend hours at the Mystic Forge doing X, Y, or Z. You're telling me this stuff is actually way more simple and it's just that people don't realize, you know, I, I personally have underestimated how long this stuff, oh, sorry, overestimated how tedious this all is. Do you understand? Because okay, I think that's the main thing people are going to be thinking. Like, I don't want to spend ages standing at the Mystic Forge doing X, Y, and Z. Is that not actually a problem? That's not, I mean... You know, it, you can't if you can't take twenty minutes of your time just to do a couple of clicking. You, I mean, it's not okay. going to take that much time, right? You know, for example, you need X amount of spirit shards uh, if you need to convert, you know, whatever that you need to convert, right? And that's your play time. And if you're essentially just playing the game, right? And assuming the player has max mastery so that they're actually earning spirit shards uh, per hour uh, or per uh, per level up, it, it you know you're just accumulating all that wealth playing you're not being forced okay i gotta grind five ten hours of this no you know you just go about your game get your xp levels up you know if you're running your boosters and whatnot okay and then at the, you'll notice that at the end of the day you will have the spirit shards which will give you the resources to make said conversions to make said weapons right you know you also need spirit shards to make legendary weapons yeah absolutely. Um, and, and it's used for a lot of other crafting things that you would need spirit shards right I have one more question as well before I let you continue along that I think people are going to be wondering about. And that's uh, how do you all feel then about ArenaNet's deliberate decision not to include direct player trading in the game, right? Because what you're talking about, you know, this thing about trust, really that was that was something they decided. They want you in the TP, right? They they don't want you direct trading, otherwise they would have added a system. Is that, is that something you're angling for? Should we give him the biggest shock of all, MM? Oh. You can go ahead. Okay. Um, okay, so this is where we need to use what McDonald's is doing, right? So if you look at the business model of McDonald's, what kind of business are they? Uh, what kind of... Uh, uh, well, what do you mean? You, you know, the, the fast food chain, yeah. Well, you yeah. know, they're a, they're a, they're a um, service business. They, they offer you the service of cooking your food. They buy in from manufacturers and then they give it to you. Right. The thing about that is that that is not how they're making a, uh, their billions of dollars per year, right, on the annual quarter. They are not a burger business. They're actually a real estate business. So the concept is no different than, say, like, you know, in ancient times where a king owns land and peasants pay tribute to the king uh, currently. But for, um, some, uh, for someone on the scale of McDonald's, right, their business model is they go and buy land, right? And they use that to make the bridge of the trade between them and the franchisee, where the franchisee has to do business with McDonald's by paying rent for the land that they're leasing to make burgers to sell, right? right. So they get business, uh, they get business, and uh, that's how McDonald's get upfront capital. They use that capital to expand, and so on and so on, right? It's a self-feeding mechanism. For Guild Wars 2 to translate this, right? So let's say, for example, I need your spare shards. I have to transfer for a particular deal like our, like uh, for our guild. I have to transfer sixty stacks of mats to you. And do you think we can you do that in the mail system where you can get suppressed into, um, into uh, mails? Oh, Not really. Right? You're using guild storage. I understand. The guild bank is the trading platform, which necessitates the need for proper guilds to be set up. As a matter of fact, you you see all the world v world and PVE commanders who play every day. Most of our deals are through them. We pay them weapons, they give us mats. So what are they farming up? They're farming spirit shards for their whole entire guild and making 
and buying spare shards, packaging it, and sending straight to us. It's a self-feeding mechanism. Right. Okay, I'm understanding now. Everything you're saying is starting to click. Right. This, there's a critical flaw in the trading post, which is, you know, there's a 500 gold cap on the mail. There's also a 10,000 gold cap on the trading post. And that creates a very weird situation. And not only that, but we're also competing with the European community because both trading posts are connected to each other. Yeah, so well, hold on. Is it weekly? Is it 10k weekly, you're trying to say? I didn't know about that. Case. No, it's 500 gold weekly. Mm -hmm. But the listing of the 10,000 gold cap changes the nature of our entire uh, economy, right? Because we can't list anything above 10,000 gold, which pretty much forces us to use mats as a form of currency rather than gold. So yeah. we completely go off tangent off of what uh, you would expect from a normal player to operate in this game. Well, Guild Wars 1 was the same, right? And I wonder whether ArenaNet knew that going into Guild Wars 2, because we had like the 100 yeah, plant limit, the 1,000, and then p that's why Ectos were a thing, right? Arm braces of truth and stuff, if you guys played that game. Played that. Same thing. Right. But uh, in every design decision of every MMO, and this is just from my observation, they do things for a reason. And one of the reasons is, is that if they don't put these structural caps in place or limit the way how we trade, um, bad elements of the game, such as RMT years or, you know, people who organize bots or anything can overtake the game and pretty much ruin the economy for all of us. So I highly think and uh, ultimately this is one of the toughest games I've ever experienced to make money in for you know trying to lever up compared to other games I've been a part of but Ainit has been the most responsible um, developer of the MMOs I have played oh, wow. to focus on helping the players out the problem is the players are not figuring this out as fast enough right and knowing that the guild bank is a, such an essential central important point for all players to realize that that's where the junction of map flow occurs necessitates the needs of construction of guilds and communities and such so and so forth right and yeah you're right i mean people are slow we're seven years in and how mm -hmm. long do you think your community's been rolling we got together two years ago right mm uh, mm would explain it better than i do i would say almost three years uh we hit three years in like a couple of months or something uh, but as as a community guild yeah we've been at this for three years you know each of us has been more than that in their own mind right as experienced traders um but it goes back to that thing i was trying to tell you is that when all is said and done and you see this with it was like the main thing that we keep going back to is guild right a guild is what it functions and what we did right now you have your your training post barons who in the past have uh, you know they work individual on their own level right usually a trading post baron uh he'll have investments on the trading post whether it's uh, items that he will flip on a daily basis weekly basis or a long-term speculation right um and usually that doesn't require you to be with many people and you can basically just talk and discuss things with, with players but you're not really relying on other people right you're only relying on yourself mm -hmm. um, and what what has happened over the years is that flipping has hit a capping point and you know you can only make x on the gold per day off flipping on the trading post because per day you're only limited to the activity of the player base that day right um and, and in a sense uh you could you know when your investment hits your rois can be great as great as even 100 percent over uh, what you were investing in, uh, but what you come down to limitation is if you don't have said asset and you would like to find it in the cheapest way possible, well, if you don't want the prices of the trading post, again, you go back to someone, which is your friend in this case, and or guild mate, and again, you basically lower your costs when you have people who already have said resource available. All it takes is what do they need to give it up for you, right? And what do you have to give up for them? You're saving yourself that time of, you know, putting in the buyers, or you're saving yourself the 15% tax, or they would also save themselves that tax. And, and again, you know, you, you go back to that player trading like you were talking about, which, you know, creates a system now two players are gaining, right? It's not just one guy on one end made the money and the other person did it. Right, so do you right. think it's taken some years to get to this point because inflation has hit a point where these caps are more relevant for flippers uh, and things move a little bit slower on the TP now, so people are looking at these new opportunities and thus guilds like yours have started to be born, you know, five years deep. In my, in my, years deep. 
in my humble opinion, it doesn't take that long to set it up. As long as you have two or three people you can trade with, you can formulate your own operation. But the um, ultimately, the, the ultimate manifestation of this system has been the Gilders 2 Reddit exchange, right? Of all the groups and guilds and individual players and our guild in particular, we all converge on that because ultimately we don't have every available resource. We're not self-sufficient. Right. Just for so, everyone watching, do you want to explain, just in very plain terms, what the Reddit exchanges, the Guild of Sea Reddit exchanges? Um, so the Reddit exchange is pretty much a Reddit, a community of people where we take trades outside of the guild and outside of the. We're able to do trades such as uh, queen bees, chalks, anything like that that requires big, um, big type of currency. So there's the and... 10k limit, and you can go there to make a trade direct with a player outside of the TP because it's going to require more money than the TP will allow you to do in a single trade, right? That's that. That's what I understood the the, the creation of the exchange was for in the first place. Yeah, exactly. Like if someone has a few big big ticket items that they want to unload from themselves for some other type of material, they're not going to go toss it into the TP if they don't have the connection of the TP guild, obviously. They're going to go to the exchange. They're going to set up their deal. They're going to be moderated because there, there are plenty of moderators in there to make sure that the deal seem fair to everybody. There's a price tag. There's a username. Everything's pretty much being accounted for in there. And then a person will come by. They'll see the offer. They'll take it. And you'll do the trade in game through mail or through whatever other means they can find. Maybe they're in the same guild together. or Maybe they can join a guild or whatever it may be. It essentially there, um, they don't really care about your reputation, whether you are a famous raider, whether you are got a certain amount of achievement points on your account, whether you have people to vouch for you. The only thing that you can vouch when you're on the subreddit, the Guild Exchange, is your trading history in that, in that subreddit, right? The only care is, do you have X amount of trades under your belt and, you know, of course, the more trades give you more credibility that you're trusted on the exchange and that is the only way for someone to have uh, a credible reputation on that reddit purely based on trading activity i could when i started on the exchange you know i had to go first in terms of you know sending an item out to people um even though like a lot of people know who i am but i was at the time new to the exchange so i didn't you know tell people well i'm the richest player in the game you gotta send it to first i'm you know i'm credible right that's not what dictates whether or not i can go first on the trade you know it was all about your training history and then you build up eventually enough credibility that people can see that okay this person has a lot of uh posts written on the exchange i can trust them right yeah and so, so it acts as a way to add credibility and trustworthiness when we're dealing with the wild west of the mail system right essentially so the guys that, the guys that trade a lot you know that they're credible and they don't have to put up first they the other person does i understand that i have to add one nuance to this so this is an interesting phenomena happening on the exchange the issue of today is that if we make too much of one thing and dump it on the trading post you actually incur diminishing returns because more supply coming in means that prices will drop right mm -hmm. if demand cannot eat that up what the exchange does is it um it what you're doing is if you let's say for example you have ectos or t6 mats or anything of uh something that could be useful and remember in trade you need safe assets right and safe assets are easy liquidity something that's useful something that's part of a bigger hole like legendary weapons for example and when you package it and put it into a price that the exchange li likes it, right? If the market likes it, then you create a new demand point. And all of a sudden, new players or guilds or anyone has easy, fair access to a level playing field. Because if you look at uh, the game as a whole, you market it in state. Ain't is the state, right? They control the gold. They control the market of the trading post. But... Um, but the market field, the level playing field is up to us. Where we take our mats is up to our uh, our for, uh, our own um, decisions. But if I don't want to get less for more I sell into, I got to take it to somewhere where uh, the bulk of it can be eaten up and it doesn't damage prices on the trading post. There's right. a responsibility we all have to have is to protect the market and maintain values that is helpful for both us and the farmer. And that's one critical element a lot of people seem to forget when they play the game. 
I mean, I just wanted to bring it a little bit back to, you know, the exchange. And it's like you said uh, about how Dealers 1, that was basically it, right? Direct player to player trading. Um, now, on the exchange, I do want to say to anyone that's out there on the exchange, like I said, you know, number one rule on the exchange nobody cares what reputation you have in the game. You could be the richest player in the game uh, and you could have zero trades on the exchange. You still have to go through protocol. Right, and if you take the necessary steps, do your background check. Uh, you know, this is just a fair warning. Please click on people's names on the exchange, check their trade history, how many posts have they put up. Um, and the worst comes to worst if you feel like something is off about the deal, you know, use a middleman. There are vouched middlemen on the exchange who are also trading post barons and uh, are very trustworthy in the economy community, which is. You know, they set up this exchange to give us this access that we were missing in Dealers, in Dealers 2. Um, and the exchange is just a 2% fee, but that fee is what could save you from being scammed. So please don't, uh, you know, trade someone just because, like, they tell you they have a certain reputation, right? If they don't have a trading post history, that is not their reputation. Wooden Potatoes, would you like me to discuss how a farmer or someone who's brand new to the game can help develop assets and get themselves on the foot that can pretty much compete with us? Yeah, because I think most people listening right now, that's who they think they are. They're, they're the farmer. They're the guy that's providing the spirit shards. They're, they're the one generating the stuff, right? So yeah, how does a person like that, the, the average person, get money out of this? So there are two things that they need to do to turn their account around to get themselves to a level where they can basically gain momentum in the game. There's uh, First off, you have to understand that when you sell mats, you need to understand if you're selling to buy order, you need to make up with time, right? Because if you sell it and you incur, say, like 30 to 50 percent loss compared to, say, like if you can put it into like uh, refining it and putting it into a legendary weapon or making an ascended armor or something, you need to farm twice as hard so think really hard if you need that mat and i always follow a two week rule right if you don't need it um in two weeks go ahead and sell it right and if you want more money listed or even listed higher remember market forces when they need it they will have to pay you and if you listed higher they have to pay premium so be, be very careful how you list it but if you need money now go ahead and sell it at a price that you uh that will sell maybe to buy order but only if you feel like you have to have it, okay? That's the most important recommendation I can give for most people who's just starting out. Secondly, and uh, also incredibly important, max your masteries. I cannot emphasize as a farmer of this game and a part of the commander of the LS4 train, you have to have maximum Corteria, POF, HOT masteries, whatever, right? Because if you farm and that XP is not going anywhere, you are losing money, okay? You may not see this now, but when you get into, uh, let's say, crafting, for example, crafting your legendary weapons for yourself or for sale, whichever, you need those spirit shards. And if you have to pay someone to do that for you, you're, you have to give up gold for that. That could be saved if you actually uh, focus on getting your masteries maxed. Right. Ina did this deliberately, by the way. Yeah, I think that's really good design. I'm loving what I'm hearing. I'm loving that it matters getting this stuff rolling you know and there's a, it should be a big priority for people because i haven't felt that way before each map has their own strengths and weaknesses right because when you play you need to play for your uh to your strengths of what you need so let's say for example uh i'm interested in spear shards and i want to farm more spear shards that means that i have to play maps where i have to accomplish achievement points to accelerate my spear shard earning because the, every little bit of xp helps right so if you go to your achievement panel and open up, say, like, Silver Waste, right? General and Silver Waste. Mm -hmm. Almost 90% of the farm, uh, the Reba farm, also is attached with achievement points, right? So you have to keep in mind, these maps are not designed for just farming your life away for, like, uh, you know, pennies to the dollar. Uh, you have to excel, uh, um, accelerate your achievement points to ramp up the XP earning, right? So if that's the case, right, this is easy mode, for example. And if you go to collections, say like you go to collections and rare collections and bioluminescence, you know, for the mm -hmm. armor collection for silver waste, that's hell mode, right? 
because there's a uh, there's a great deal of achievements attached to bioluminescence and one of the components needed to complete this are the living story 2 achievements right and that's a lot of achievements right there so you see there's a uh uh an escalation of ramp up if you get more deeper into these maps and study it every single map that Enet has made has this level of um depthness into it if you can complete it all the reward is you just ramp up so if you think of maps like you know gold per hour and raw mats you generate as minimum wage how do you get the <laughs> how do you climb up the ladder you got to ramp up your achievements right same so in the real here so you're saying the more achievements people have the more ap the more xp gain and that's just like are you saying it's like exponentially better almost it's like it's really 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 important to just get the absolute max out of every map just for the sake of ap into xp gain having having this little xp helps uh would you like to know what my spear shard holding is uh is, right you're holding is in that's how many you have back. yeah would you like to know my spear shards yeah yeah, yeah, let's, hear it. yeah, yeah let's hear it i have 12 Okay, you have 12. Okay. And every time I make 200 spear shards, I can make a weapon. Or maybe 300 if I have to focus on the clovers, right? And that's the severeness of how um, I can ha I have 500,000 gold worth of mats on my account, but I can't convert it into something useful unless I have those spear shards because I trade in weapons. Wait, before you go on, I just want to know, what's your XP gain then? Because I think a lot of people like know or will be thinking about their own at the moment. And if it turns out yours is similar to theirs, they're going to be really excited and think, wow, I can do this. Like, I got 45%. Do you know what yours is? Well, uh, well, you're way ahead of me. I'm at 26,000 uh, achievement points. And my XP gain, if I uh, go into my panel uh, achievement pa point panel real quick, I'm sorry, I'm trying to find it. Um, that's 30% uh, for me. Okay. Wow. All right. All right. So I feel like I could, you know, get, uh, get a lot of this. <laughs> right. XP boosters of any kind, such as from food, you know, sended, the sended food is really impactful. I cannot emphasize how significant that particular booster is in World v. World and in PvE. But um, that uh, food helps, the infusion in your amulet helps, the plus 20 XP per kill. Goes re synergizes really good with uh, some maps like LS4, right? You know, like, for example, Jahai incursion farming. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, there's lots of mobs there, Dragonfall, things like that. These maps are designed to meet the demand of what they expect from uh, what players are expecting, right? So when Anit, I've always had the idea that when Anit is looking and designing the system, they're data driven, right? They have to see what's in our banks. They have to see what our output and input is on each character. And they always add in something that they know the community needs. And one of the things that our operation always needs is XP. So thankfully we really love Anet, right we we love all their design decisions with these new maps because they keep pushing xp out this is cool man it makes me think of all the xp mm -hmm. uh kind of techniques i would use to quickly level a character like with uh kill streak boosters and stuff and killing ambience around Cortirian maps that give you loads you're telling me that actually has meaning even after you're 80 and even you know that's that's crazy as a matter of fact, a lot of our people in our TP network has taken up your Guild Wars 2 uh, uh, Guild Masters challenge. It's actually, we've discovered that that's actually the most important um, objective for us to ramp up our money production wow. because you're, we're uncapping the uh, bottleneck of spirit shards for our production. Uh, Wait, and you're telling me then like tomes, I've always bagged on tomes of knowledge. I've got thousands of tomes. They're, they're spirit shards though, right? You're telling me even those are useful. <laughs> As you open up the spirit shard on a level 80 character, right, the tome of knowledge, you're getting one shard yeah. per, per tome. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Okay, so let's say I'm just a, a random player out there. I've got a ton of spirit shards, like me, with all my tomes of knowledge and stuff, and I think I know how to get experience. I've got some ideas for that. How do I know like how much I'm going to sell a spirit shard to? Like, I'm going to go to your community or communities like yours. How, how do I know how much I get for each of those? How's that all come to Well. Well, you can't take uh, spirit shards and just mass produce a particular map because that kind of that will produce diminishing returns. But you have to look at the bigger picture of what you're using them for. So if you look at, a, say, like a legendary, for example, and you let's say you pull a wiki page about how to make a particular legendary weapon, there's two things you're going to notice. There's every map associated with the legendary weapon 
at some point or another does need a spear shard to construct that mat otherwise you have to go to the training post and if that's the case then you have to target the base mat that you need to sink the spear shard up to actually create the mats and if you need to push that weapon out faster and you don't have much gold spear shards is an alternative way to discount the weapon without having to touch your gold to, pro uh, to produce such a weapon what they do with the weapon however for their personal need or let's say they need extra gold and stuff like that is their own decision right it Re, uh, people will have different values of feelings of spirit shards based on how they use it and that's the most important part about spirit shards right so if i you're saying not to do this because it would tank the economy but if i wanted to put all twelve thousand of my spirit shards into blood and only blood there'd be a certain value there but if i wanted to do oh. it in x y and, Z, and that would be bad because it would you know create too much supply right but you're saying right, that and and the market will punish you if you do that, right? Because they will, people like us will see that the, uh, someone's doing this and they're undervaluing the things. And what we're going to do is we're just going to come in and buy it all up. Right. right? Okay. But right. the thing is, is that we're not going to buy it at the extremely high price when someone's making a stunt like this. So always remember what you do has equal opposite or has consequences. It has consequences when you take an action on the market. If you too, put too much in and get too greedy, the market will come in and punish you. Because it's people like us and players and all that stuff who actually sees, uh, you know, it's like going thrift shopping, right? If I see a value that's undervalued, I'm going to buy it up. But if I see something that I know it's not worth it to buy it right now, but it's maybe worth it later, I'm going to hold back. So people need to realize the market is a living entity. It's an aggregate of millions of players all looking at the same thing. So put, put this into concrete terms for me. What do I do with my spirit shots? So, um... So for if I were to give the biggest advice to most people and in, in that's watching this stream, I would uh, recommend um, running a map completion. Okay, because uh, one thing everybody knows is you can't make a, a legendary weapon without this, especially if you're not uh, developing at uh, if you don't have many assets to work with, right? And the thing is, is that world completion does two things. One, it gets you more mechanically associated with the game because most of the hearts does give clues to farming techniques right for example you know the your boots bad builds uh, videos that you you are part of yeah absolutely yeah. some of some of your builds actually makes world completion a complete joke right right and a quick hint <laughs> dead eye <laughs> cough cough <laughs> right okay but, i'll be sure to let um, boots know <laughs> yeah so but boots uh, actually as a matter of fact boots has been a very big part of our development in the TP guild, so we would like to meet him at some point. Oh, wow, I will let him know then. Uh, yeah, his builds have been incredibly valuable for farming in particular because we've been going into really tough farms where you know you're getting damaged non stop and we need sustained builds. And Boots has been putting out some magnificent builds that actually assist us with our farming tech. Okay, cool. So, so you're saying to do map completion because the only way that start the gifts of exploration can be made is from map completion. You can't get around it. So, so, when you have a map completion, that enables you to sync your mats to maximize the value of map. For example, let's say for example we get a map completion, we use our spirit shards to produce mats at the cheapest rate possible, right? Because remember, we're all profiteers, right? In essence, what you're actually doing, as long as you're combining spear shards, you know, your playtime with this, you're taking a 40 copper mithra or putting it into, uh, say, like a gift of metal, for example, for whatever legendary weapon. When you sell it post tax, you're actually amplifying the return back, right? right. And when you, uh, sometimes it could be double, right? You probably get 70 copper post tax bats. That's way better than selling the mithra or at 40 copper lowest listing and getting through maybe 33 copper back you know i can't remember 15 percent of 40 copper but you see there's a very big uh uh wealth difference between someone who actually uses the mats for a purpose versus someone who's going for the quick buck right? so you're saying one of the big principles here is don't sell the mats directly m turn them into something and then the return mm -hmm. is so much bigger this creates a very new, uh, this is one of the missing game elements of the game is that a lot of people love to theory craft, but what people tend to miss is that they also have to theory craft about the flow of mats in this game. What is Anet adding to the game? What are they taking out and all that stuff, right? And you need to find out where the sources of these mats are, because if you start to understand where they are and stuff like that, you can understand prices and then you can understand, whoa, I can actually double my money if I do it this way. It's all about efficiency. And that's the missing element of this game, right? 
Well, what do you mean it's missing? You're, you're, you're saying to try and predict upcoming patches and what the devs might, you know, might flood the economy with or might ask you for. So you remember when Istan came out and Volatile Magic was the name of the game for money making back then? Right. Where you can take, you know, use that, buy leather and trophy boxes and sell it straight to the trading post. What was the byproduct of the trophy box? What do you think that was? Uh, I can't it's remember. I didn't really participate map. in it. What was it? T5 mat, because you can either get a T6 or a T5 mat, right? Right. And people would sell that off because they don't know what to use it for, right? And so these T5 mat went to rock bottom. And what that did was it manipulated the gift of fortune prices. And all we did had to do was combine a spirit shard with the T5 mats to pump out very cheap gift of fortunes. That greatly cut down the cost of a legendary one. So the game flooded with T5s. The average player just wanted the convenience or didn't know that they could use spirit shards to transmute them into T6s. So you do that. You buy it off the TP, you you tear it up, and all of a sudden gifts of fortune are way cheaper. But the everyman lost out because they weren't thinking. They didn't know these these. Yeah. An astute player who actually understands the legendary system would see that there's a devaluation of a particular mat, and they have resources such as uh, holdings of spirit shards, maybe holdings of ectos. Ectos are a very important part of the economy. It's an oil uh, economy. If you have such mats and you see a, a, a phenomena like this that Anet is actually allowing to happen, you can take advantage of that. Was well, a similar thing at play when Lake Doric came out and all the leather was thrown into the game? Correct, because that opened up um, ecto production on the massive scale because the thick leather turned out to be a bottleneck to uh, ecto production. I'll leave your uh, fans to uh, look that up on the wiki. Interesting. See, this is kind of cool for me to hear because usually when I see something like this, I think that that's just opportunity has been lost. Oh, now this area that market's been flooded. So I, I never really look deeper because I'm like, well, there's no money in that mat anymore. So whatever. But you're telling me actually this is unlocking stuff. You just need to think about the recipes that are in the game particular you have to keep in mind what's at play here not only are you farming mats doing whatever you're doing if you can be soloing or you can be doing a farm or you can be in world v world or pvp or whatever you're actually farming mats that the game uh, outright produces but what else are you farming you're also farming spear shards on the side you're also farming karma on the side which is also equally important right these things add up but most people think 16 gold an hour as a matter of fact the ls4 train that i'm putting together in you know after the ist or if i had to string together events of all maps right to move the group from one map to another you know you can easily double the value if you can utilize all the resources that's provided to you Enet has given people the opportunity to maximize their returns. They just have to use every part of it. And that means that you have to have a very good knowledge of what the game is all about, in specific, how the mats are used. That's the missing element of the game. And, I, you know, for me in particular, I would love more people to begin talking about that. Yeah, I'm terrible at all this stuff. I, I just look at karma as just nothing. I look at spirit shards as nothing. I don't, I don't pay attention to it a lot of the time. You know, I just sell straight on the TP any items and look at my liquid gold. That, that's as far as I think about it a lot of the time. Going back to, like Lucian said, when you're completing a gift of mastery, right? After you finish your world exploration, um, you know, if you don't have the resources to make a weapon, you know, yourself, you know, sell that weapon on the trading post for profit or use that weapon for high value trades, whatever you want to use with it. There's always the option of selling said gift of mastery, right? And you know, people don't realize that even though things are account bound, still certain ways of you know trading said materials with each other right like like, like through guild wars 2 exchange and the subreddit or through mm -hmm. specific you know so like like a gift of mastery i would say the buyer send the, the the person who's crafting the weapon for me the materials precursors right i cover the clover cost if that's part of the deal um and they make that weapon for me and send it back and then i pay them a fee for the gift of mastery right now the example the market rate for the gift of mastery is uh between our guild and what the exchange sets is 500 gold for the master, right? Which includes, I will also provide the 231 coins, 231 ectos uh, to make sure you roll the clovers, right? Um, so just to be and, clear for everyone who might not be following along, if you get map completion and you get a gift of exploration, which allows you to get a gift of mastery, so that's you're putting forward your karma, your spirit shards, your gift of exploration, you can sell that to other players for about 500 gold because they don't want to do it, so they'll send you the pre and all the mats, you craft it and send the legendary back, and you've just netted 500 gold, right? And that's, that's an example of going outside of the TP. 
and that that could get you the you know if you have two you could sell those two and that's a thousand gold on your account you know and, and this isn't to say that you know that's all you should do sell your get the masteries to the big buyers right because eventually that's what you want to branch out and maybe end up doing yourself later right so you take that thousand gold and like Zushin said when you have that capital the next one you can make the weapon yourself and you know through these methods of different farming uh that we'll even get into specifics even our ls4 meta train solution uh, detail if people are interested on you, you know you can bring the costs down for the future things that you can do. I, I love hearing that you can get a leg up and start to the order of a thousand gold which most people would never imagine them having that listen to this video i love hearing that this is possible from stuff that is as casual as a map completion, like most people do a map completion, you know, map completion is like one of the most standard things. And here you are saying you can really get started with the economy right here with this big money. Like people are going to be excited to hear that. And here's the thing, though, um, with things like Taco and Tekkit's Guide, you know, there's very well, uh, you know, well-made applications that make map completion easier, even to the person who, you know, would need that extra help, you know, where the markers that take them. Yeah, you just follow the routes so. and stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and and you're 12 hours in, 13 hours in, you just realized you have a thousand gold sitting in uh, that you can make, right? Uh, of course, it requires spirit shards, which goes back in to what zushin has been saying all along, you know, and you you slowly start to see how all of this connects into one thing, right? Everything bottlenecks to those spirit shards so, and your XP gain. So here's my, here's my question. Um, the people, you guys, you're starved for spirit shards. Lots of people listening will have them. If I want to relinquish those somehow, if I want to profit off of those, do I need to find a community like yours, found a community like yours, or can I just do this at Mystic Forge? Uh, to what extent am I reliant on people like you and creating communities like you? Well, this is where we need the commanders to step up and guild leaders. So uh, we made contact with the Spanish community on the European side, and don't ask me how we got to translate this. And my, my lecture in particular in Spanish, that was difficult. <laughs> Once they started clicking on this, they realized that they could set up their own mini guild of trading outpost operations. And here's the ultimate power of how a trade works with spirit charts to, answer, to go into answering your question, right? Let's say, for example, uh, you need a dusk for your twilight, right? Mm -hmm. And I need conversions. You can come up to me and say, Zushin, uh, I need uh, a dusk. I have all these spirit shards. I don't need them. Uh, can I do something with them? And I say, you know what? I got some conversions that I need to be that needs to be done. And uh, so, if you can handle like, let's say, seven hundred spirit shards worth of uh, uh, conversions, which probably will take about an hour of clicking, right? There's your dusk, right? Okay, oh, interesting. So it would be like me and you, we'd be in the guild, you'd dump a ton of mats in the guild bank, I'd withdraw those, start transmuting them up. Once I've done the job for you, you give me a precursor. Now, I have to trust you because, you know, at any point you can skim me, right? So right, that's where or the, the other way around. Is. You could not send the pre in the end, you know. You have to have that trust there, just like at the exchange. So we always say that whenever you're doing business with someone, you have to go on a date with them and you have to build <laughs> that special bond with them, right? <laughs> Very but nice. this is also important for guilds in particular, right? Because when you go in a guild, you're expected to join a family, right? But that means that you have to give something to the guild and the guild has to give something to you. If you if that element is not there, the guild will fail, right? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And that's where the commanders and guild leaders have to step up is because when they need something, let's say, for example, do you think uh, I in particular, and I'm just saying me, right? and wanting to buy all the T6s on the trading post. Not really, because when I look at the system, I'd rather put my money to players who can use it and they do work for me that I could use for my profit, right? So my money goes through people before it ends up on the trading post anyways. It does an extra step of work. Right. So are you actually oh, advocating yeah. the regular guilds because there's going to be loads of those casual guilds just groups of friends world versus world guilds raid guilds fractal guilds guilds you know like my own you're you're casual you're advocating even communities like this should get involved and look at trading spirit shards among one another and dealing with transmutation in this way because you can profit on it without even being wholly dedicated to it it's not even uh, even without such a you know most of these details just as a guild you know before you think of selling said item Go ask a friend, go ask a guild member first, you know, 
you give the opportunity that someone in your community might want it before you give it to the trading post and someone else from another community gets it. You know what I mean? See, um, I, I hear you say that. I get the principle. What I'm cynical to is, is that really going to be worth my time to mess around with that and socialize and spend that on such small scales? Like, surely it's only at massive scales this stuff becomes relevant. You, is this just efficiency? For you the have to... You, you have to start somewhere though, right? You take us back three years ago, we're not, we weren't at the scale that we were today. You know, right now we're like an empire. Three years ago, this guild started with like 12 people. Like I maybe had one conversion every other day. Um, I maybe had two gift of masteries that were sold to me at a week's notice versus today where most of us are doing multi-level deals. Actually, MM, uh, let Red tell how he made his money. I think his deal would be give some insight to this. Actually, yeah. Yeah, Red, do you want to... So, like we said uh, about Red, is that he's only been with us for two months and discovered our ways of money making and it's helped him revamp his ways of playing the game and actually doing the refresher. The interesting is, uh, Red is part of a guild community uh, that I, I guess is basically the audience that's watching this video. So, Red, do you want to give an indication of what you did with the guild that you're in? Uh, so yeah, like I said, I uh, I actually found Sushin on uh, LS4 uh, train, and he was talking about money making. So I decided to join the Discord, and after I'd say listening to his lecture a few times, I it kind of clicked with me. Sorry, wait, when you said LS4 train, you mean you were just playing in you know, a Zerg going through doing the events in Living World Season Four, right? That's what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And they, they, you know, they talk about it. They start saying, hey, guys, you know, you can do X, Y, and Z. While they're doing the train, the commanders are, the commanders that we have in TP are amazing people. They give you information as you're doing the train. They're more than willing to talk. And having them as a bridge between your average farmer and a guild like TP is great because it captured someone like myself. And because of that, I decided to talk with Susan on uh, Discord. Okay, and this was two months ago. And from there? So, from there, they told me about the value of spirit shards, and I looked at my account. I didn't have that many spirit shards, but I had enough to start me off a little. I took his lecture wholeheartedly, and I made my first legendary weapon with their method. I sold it on the TP, made some gold, and I said, okay, well, what can I do next? I don't have that many spirit shards. But maybe I can do some conversion sets. Well, I can't do that many myself because, again, I have a finite number of spirit shards. Well, they said, oh, well, if you have a community behind you, a guild, maybe you can talk to them, see if they can do conversions for you, too. And I happen to be part of a raiding guild. They're a small group, um, and they're pretty much just raiders. They don't do much else. Uh, they do some open world content here and there. They, they, they meme around. You know, They like to have fun in the game. And I spoke with some of them. And they're like, oh, yeah, I have like 15,000 spirit shards. I have like 20,000 spirit shards. I have like X amount of totem knowledges. And I'm like, oh, cool. Let me buy them off of you. So I started off by buying a lot of the spirit shards from my guild members and making a profit off of that. And I explained it to them the whole, the whole way that I was doing. I was like, hey, guys, I'm buying you spirit shards for X and I'm making Y as a profit just so you know and they're like that's cool we don't want to do that anyways we just want to get the quick gold and for them that was perfect they just wanted to make some quick gold and they were able to do plenty of conversions throughout the week for me at whatever leisurely time they wanted to do it they could watch a netflix video they could do something else it was perfect for them and because of that i was able to build myself from my measly 500 gold to 10k pretty quickly by doing deals like that getting more spirit shards bought up from people that had just had them stored away in their account for years not knowing what to do with them and are, now are we still talking purely the world of t6 upgrades here or is there other stuff you guys are being kind of evasive about and you kind of you know well, you're think okay about to... right you remember the champ boss uh a rush from that enid had two weeks ago or three weeks i remember so so what happened there was everybody went to Frostgorge to begin farming the marks up because of the number of champions in Frostgorge. But coincidentally, that was also Frostgorge week. So Charged Lodestone was one of the primary map drops from when you do X amount of events, right? Mm -hmm. And so what that did was it crashed the value of um, 
of lodestones down to something like 45 silver at one point. Now, if you look at the uh, how to make lodestones, you have to combine two cores together, right? Notice it also uses a crystalline dust, and also notice it uses a spirit shard, right? A three spirit shards equals ten of uh, five mystic crystals, right? Right. So when we look at the lodestones at that price, oh my god, it was at discount, right? I would buy it up, but. Uh, the reason why is I'm not willing to throw a spear shard to make that because it's already cheap on the train post. That's why I buy it up. Now the lodestones have pretty much gone back to their equilibrium because the farm is not there anymore. And it takes like two or three weeks for a price to adjust. And when it gets back to equilibrium or something, then I'm saying, hmm, is it worth ch chucking in 30 spear shards, maybe some play time because of my ectos and stuff like that. And I can make it in 50 gold rather than spending 75 for it. I'd say that's worth it. Okay. And look at spirit shards you have to look at it as a way to discount stuff only when the market allows it to so do you think so now you're talking about loads too do you think a really great piece of advice for people listening is to go to the wiki and look at philosopher's stones mystic crystals stuff like that and just see what recipes they're involved in and then make their own decision at that time uh which one they want to go for in life whenever you're uh, i'd say to everybody make your first legendary weapon so you get the street smarts of what to hold and what not to hold because ultimately when you're making the legendary weapon piece by piece you need to choose the cheapest option that's available to you so if you have lots of spear shards in low gold maybe it might be worth it to convert uh, mats to make that particular mat rather than spending full price on the trading post and you know paying someone a premium for that okay buy orders will go a long way too to um, help um, reduce cost right so if you let's say for example charged uh, cores right is for like four or five silver per core maybe worth it to buy order it if you need to make a hundred lodestones for say like sunrise or bolt or whatever right and that goes the same with others but if let's say for example onyx lodestones go down to like 10 silver is it worth to promote not really right because you know Spirit Shards could be allocated somewhere else that's more efficient. Maybe uh, you have enough gold to buy it. It really depends on the player's decision, and we can't teach people yeah. how to spend their money. We can only advise which is efficient and which is not efficient. Yeah, and to use your own brain, basically. You know, There's not one, right. one size fits all. Absolutely. This is one of the reasons why, to us, gold is not really that important other than buy orders, right? We don't need that much gold to increase wealth, right? We base our wealth based on liquid holdings, which means you know the accumulation of mats and we need more mats because you know say like for example chack infusion and confetti the problem with these items is these are items are exceeding twenty thousand gold and we can't trade with gold when it comes to that we have to use mats to trade right and because of that the nature of gold has changed gold is not a priority for our guild we prioritize mats and the accumulation of mats. so back to red story uh you you'd started this with the conversions is that the whole story and now you're twenty thousand gold richer in two months or, or is <laughs> well, there another layer listen. here no th there's a few other layers here because now okay so you're taking a, a group of players a small group of players again we're raiders so we only need like 12 people max in our guild now you're taking our group of players and I'm like chucking, literally chucking gold at them. They're making more gold as a community. They're making more gold than I was making. And I was perfectly happy doing that because I knew the, the amount of profit I was getting. And they were like, oh, let me, let me, get, let me get mail capped. I want to get mail capped a week. Every week I want to have 500 gold to pick up from the mail. I'm like, yeah, no problem. Just do this for me. And at first it was just spirit shards, right? This was their quick, easy gold. After a while, they started noticing, okay, well, our spirit shards are, are going to start getting lower. Hey, let's go do dungeons. Let's go do other events. Oh, let's run the LS4 train with you guys, and let's get big numbers. Let's try to see what we can do. Now, my raid community, they are playing the game a little more. They're doing map comps for me, so they're, I'm buying up their map comps. They're buying up... Uh, so, so, for instance... One person is selling me a map comp, right? We, we already stated that it's 500 gold. And they're building Exordium. I'm going to pay them Mystic Curios and Amalgamated Gemstones because I'm helping them get what they want. And all of a sudden, they're like, oh, hey, I need a precursor. Or, oh, hey, I need this, I need that. And I am more than happy to provide a link between the TP guild and the mass amount of resources that is MM and the guild and my small community that is now able to 
build up their their assets, build up their gameplay, they now have a tangible goal, a much easier goal to achieve. Rather than before, it's like, oh, well, building a Gen 2 legendary weapon is going to be really hard. Like, I need to farm a lot of gold. A lot of them would just, you know, grind over and over and over and get their X amount of gold a week from the raids and do whatever possible. And it, a, a lot of them got taxed out by that. They didn't want to do that anymore. They, they hardly logged in anymore. Now, I see them logging in all the time, doing random stuff, map breaking even. They're just having fun in the game because they have found something that makes the game easier for them, makes the game a little bit more accessible for them. And I feel like if TP has brought anything to my life, it's being able to help me enrich other people's gaming experience. And it's been the ability to hey, say, hey, you have this problem. I have this solution. So I want to make sure that your problem is no longer a problem and that you're just playing the game and thoroughly enjoying it and doing content. There is so much content in this game that I feel like is so untapped. It's so left behind. It's like, oh, you know, it's a dead game. No one wants to play this anymore. There's no content. The the creators don't give out anything. That is such a lie. <laughs> there, there are so many things to do. There are so many achievements to get. There are so many community-driven things. And like I said again, you don't need a huge group of people. You need one or two individuals that are playing together, maybe a bigger group of five, whatever it is. They now have incentive to want to play. They now have a goal that is within their reach. It's not something that they can never get to. It's not something that, you know, is being barred away by a massive price tag. To word this in another way, are you essentially saying experience is worth so much and experience is generally more fun to get because you can get it from so many places that people are missing out on what it really means to enjoy the game? Because you just mentioned dungeons. Like, dungeons are good for experience, if I remember. Probably better Ooh. than raids, right? Because of all the trash kills. Dungeons, achievement points. Like, a uh, dungeon frequenter, uh, dungeoneer, you have to get that done. That is such a huge amount of achievement points you're missing out. That's cool to hear that there's profit in dungeons. And so is that essentially what you're saying? Legendary weapons. Okay. And yeah, you need those for legendary weapons for the for the tokens of the dungeon. So people are now running dungeons over and over again. And it's like there's there's just so many things to do now with, uh, with having that connection. So what I'm hearing so far is two big things. One, legendary uh, weapon crafting uh, and, you know, getting gifts of exploration, getting the tokens so that you can essentially sell gifts of mastery and so on is huge. And I'm hearing that spirit shards are, uh, you can sell those at a premium. You can utilize those instead of just dumping your mats around on the TP. You can utilize those in a really big way. Right. And it's the guild's responsibility, commanders and all that stuff to maintain this proper environment. So one of the important things that we did in the guild is we set this value spear charts to a certain value right now. I can't give that out because, um, you know, I think it's unfair to a guild like ours. It took us two years to get to this number, but every guild can start somewhere and begin deducing where the sweet spot is for trading with farm between farmers and barons, right? Right, where you get the maximum number of people interested in selling and the maximum number of interest, people interested in buying, right? You can just find that yeah, out amongst now, yourself. Now, if you have a, a, a trade network and a supply of credit, let's say, for example, I got a map completion. I have a precursor and I'm missing some mats, but I really want to make the weapon. I don't have enough gold, right? Right. Someone like MM, and I'm just I'm not saying every guild has this, but someone like MM can just give me a legendary weapon. I can sell that and I can pay him back uh, uh, for his contribution. Now, I may have to throw... Uh, so, you know, like a conversion, maybe 60 spirit shards or something to help him out, right, as interest rate. But I'm willing to accept uh, paying some of my playtime to just get the ball rolling into the next project I have, right? Mm -hmm. So, but the fact of the matter is, is if you peg the spirit shard to a particular value, which is the playtime value, then all of a sudden everything matters, right? <laughs> Uh, because you know that you're building equity and let's say you build a sufficient amount of spear shards well you can either make legendary weapons or you can produce mats and trade with someone like mm who's you know buying stuff or you can take it to the market but always remember choose the cheap, uh, cheapest option to make stuff and remember protect your markets you can't get too greedy you put in a billion powerful bloods in the market what is that going to do 
uh, we're just going to wait until that goes to zero and then we're going to buy it up, right? You know, so the diversify. market will react to you. Yeah. You cannot go into a market um, thinking that it's going to, pre it's predictable in a certain way. When you do something to the market and you get too greedy, the market will fight back. Okay, so are you hoping that people who watch this video are going to have their own spirit shards and they're going to want to sell to you guys specifically? Or is that more of an internal thing to you guys with your price that you're not really interested in looking at other people that you might not be able to trust? So you're hoping they're going to set up their own, their own things? So as one of the original architects of this system in the TP Guild, now keep in mind, this is a system that we use, right? But we've been debating for quite some time what's going on with the economy. And one thing we have noticed, especially in our farm communities, that many guilds are not able to keep up. And one of the primary issues I get out of every commander is that they say it's just not worth it. So one of the main issues I see in the game right now is that player liquidity is at an all-time low because they're selling their mats too cheap they're making us money and we're reaping the benefit like for us i mean we're we're you know for for a typical transaction in the year we we clock at eight million gold worth of trades every year right Jesus. and uh, that's three times more than what we did last year it's just that um because we're sucking up all this productivity into our network and remember we don't look at gold the same way as other people do we use mats as gold and when you think about it the more mats we have and the cheaper we can get things so that we can amplify profit and as long as we know how to uh, sell stuff correctly meaning not get greedy i have to emphasize that part we can self-sustain but the other guilds are not and because uh, i look at commanders especially world v world i'm a world v world commander right right and i'm in pve right. now and the one thing that i realized is that you can't go from an event an event and have like a more than a five minute gap because if you do that you lose the attention of the zerg and you're going to lose players right and that kills momentum right in pve it goes all the way down to two minutes and 30 seconds if you're not doing stuff all the time you could lose momentum and how does a commander respond to that they got to keep you know farming but they will burn out right an efficient trading system will help people understand that if they build up liquidity it's easier to produce stuff and that's what we think is needed in the game right on i mean aina is trying there are, i i know that there's criticism of aina whether they're trying or not or something but in my in my chair looking at the system everybody has to understand that the game can only function if we make it and we allow it and we organize ourselves for that to make the uh, game great the developers can only throw us the tools right but when people don't uh control their resources properly and they bleed out like that they just can't build the momentum they need to continue and that's how you can typically lose a player base overnight right we're trying our best to maintain buy order prices at a higher threshold because you know we know that we have to give back to the community and we do that through the trading post right we will always buy stuff if people are willing to sell it to buy order right but you obviously know that that's just feeding us more money but that's the best we can do right i just want to add to that like in a sense, uh, if we can go back a couple months, do you remember the Festival of the Four Winds that came out earlier this year, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the underlying factors that that event showed is that there is not enough gold in the system and its economy. Not to say that the 1% is lacking, it's actually, the problem is that 90% of the community is lacking and that's actually hurting the whole game's economy. One of the things with Four Winds, um, I'm just going to say this out there because, I mean, it's really a no-brainer if you knew what this was uh, a lot of the flipping and speculation was you know unidentified gear and you know hoarding up all those base materials that you get from the unidentified gear uh, you know in the in the festival you can buy the zephyrite boxes with these materials right the one ecto per box uh, 15 ore per per box whatever the value was and a lot of these base materials were hoarded up by a lot of investors Big and small, uh, top money makers and uh, middle average. Yeah, even I, just to be clear, even I, I was Ecto gambling before the festival came out. And I heard, oh, keep your Ectos because you can buy those boxes in the Festival of the Four Winds. So I held on to some Ectos, wondering if the price would change. It never did in the right. end. It didn't, right? Because what people's expectations were that the Ectos would rise in price based on the activity level of the players, right? The, this event, it necess like the necessity of this event was that the more people gamble, the more the market will move and the more you'll make an upside on your investment. That was the speculation. Now, when the event came out, 
there was apparently not that many players that came back for the event and there was not that many people who had enough gold to even gamble so one thing i think happened with those boxes was with dragon bash before they devalued a ton of previously really expensive exotics and those were devalued in the zephyrite boxes as well so the gambling was less lucrative when the when the the festival came back so that's why i think people gambled less because it was like either get an infusion or get this rubbish thing that was just devalued by the dragon bash does that does that sound right does anyone know what i'm talking right. about well Actually, that worked in a little bit of favor. The fact that not enough of infusions dropped during those World Boss events meant that, you know, there'd be more people interested in gambling for a chance. Because if that satisfied people's appetite, then that would even make the event even worse. It's actually, the fact that there wasn't enough drops was actually a pretty good speculation that it will hold all the value of these items even further. Right. Um, and if, when the event came and there wasn't enough people gambling, there was a 20... A lot of people might know about this, but there was a 24 silver Ecto wall that was on a trading post, and that was about about just over 2,000 stacks of Ectos listed at around the 24 silver price range and over, and that's about 100,000 gold uh, when you put in the math together. That was about 100,000 gold that needs to be wiped out before the price of Ectos could even spike further, and you know, you know, maybe even push peaks of 30 silver. Right? That was the whole hill that we had to climb. Right. Now that did not happen we in fact did not even scratch the 24 silver wall so the fact that not we didn't break manage to break some part of the wall we couldn't even scratch the wall was a very big issue that the economy that has no money into it right it, you could have all the gold in the game and if there's not enough on the other side to do anything to trade with you're eventually going to de get your stuff devalued because you don't have anywhere else to put your investments into right that event showed that our game is lacking is, and the middle class of this game doesn't exist in, in some way, right? You always talk about the 1% and then the rest of the 99% of the player base, right? That's usually what's talked about. Well, so it, th there's one thing I can't quite wrap my head around. On the one hand, you're telling me that you guys are so good at this and you're able to earn so much money off of people doing these instant buys and instant sells that now there's very little left. So you want to help people out so that, you know, there is not such a big discrepancy, right? It sounds like that's what you guys want to do. But isn't that going to cut into exactly what you're doing? Is it, doesn't that... No, that, that would just make more activity appear on the market and more activity would happen if there's more people doing this. It wouldn't necessarily... Yes, competition is bad if you're trying to make profit, but competition is also good because if you're the only person on the market, are you going to handle, do you think someone like me, and if you put together the other people of a million in this game, do you think three of us could actually sustain the market by ourselves? Absolutely not. If I hold guild that conducts eight to 10 million gold worth of trades on a yearly basis, is telling you, you can't, you know, yeah. it, it, not, no one person in this market, even if, you know, the extent of the damage I could do to a market was if I was to, for example, put everything in my account out on the market. That would crash the prices maybe for three months, six months, and that would be a scramble for everyone else to figure out what's actually valued at what in those six months. But that's the extent of the damage I could do to a market. There's nothing, and after six months, the market corrects itself. Yeah, right? a, an interesting uh, example even I know about with this is about a year ago, over on the Guild Wars 1 subreddit, and the economy there is, you know, running away. There was someone ludicrously wealthy who just tried to dump all their money in lockpicks or ectos just this one person with an obscene amount of wealth and they did they crashed the economy for a while but eventually it corrected itself you know one man can't hold back the tide and that's someone who's who, who went crazy if i remember rightly it was a ludicrous number so you don't think you actually have that much power to hold back you know or fully monopolize uh, in the best way I have power in a sense, I can make something worth something if I want to, I could do this or, you know, I, I could trade things in, in ways that and, and I can bring my costs down in ways that other people can't because, you know, I have all the, you know, I have a bank under my, that I could use as my account. Um, but in a sense, yeah, again, the economy is all, there's a saying that Zushin says the, and I think he says it better about the market's rationality is that the market could be irrational far longer than you can be rational. You know what I mean? Right. So, and that applies to all the other barons. And any other baron that you bring into a podcast in the future will tell you the same thing. Not one person can control the market. Um, you can control a certain investment that you're speculating on. But, you know, you try and expose yourself by trying to 
play and screw with the market, you show your hand to someone else, right? Someone's going to see what you did and you just expose yourself and you might make the profit in the short term, but in the long term, you might risk your market share. So, um, so what you're trying to do, what all of you are trying to do and the information you're putting out right now is you're trying to create a middle class so that there is something for you to bounce off, off of in your own, you know, uh, your own attempts to accrue wealth. The middle class that would be the next first class. You know what I mean? There was a huge reign that was taken upon the skill three years ago when the top money makers, some of them quit the game. People who at that time having 300,000 gold was, you know, meant a lot of money. Uh, at that time, that was the, you know, factors of our game. Um, and they gave the reins. And we took over those reins in the sense where we stepped up as a guild, as a community, the largest trading community in the game, to make sure that you know we got what we wanted in the game. But at the same time, we elevate the game in a different economic sense, right? And same with a lot of the barons who are you know not in the guild but also connected with us. They affect it in that way. Now there is the next generation of the game, who are up and coming players like now, like someone like Red who's with us right now. He's the next generation who would take over. And push the game to the next limits that's missing that's not here right now and that's what we're trying to create okay i understand um so what other crucial information do you guys really want to get out there yeah so after you build build a safe asset it could be legendary it could be a bunch of mats could be whatever right and it will take some time it could take a world completion it could take two who knows right you could do some ls4 farm and make up the difference or you could just ls4 farm only as long as you know how to use mats however you want to do but once you get past your first legendary weapon everything else becomes easy because what you have now is a capital investment right meaning that you have uh gold to invest in you can buy some stuff if you want to skip the farming like for example wooden potatoes i think you're buying map completions from time to time correct absolutely yeah right now in fact oh, i yeah. might have a mail right now of a sold one yeah. <laughs> yeah so whenever you put in a capital investment into a gift of ma mastery for example and you buy it from someone you need to make sure you can recover it just in case two options happen if you make the weapon or if you get scammed or because at some point you have to fill that 500 gold ba uh, back or you're taking a 500 gold permanent uh, wealth loss, right? Mm -hmm. So as long as people understand how they're making that back and Spirit Shards can play a small role for that, playing the game and activities and making sure you're selling your mats properly, you can get that back. And that gives you confidence to say, hey, I can make two more weapons now or whatever, right? But um, more importantly, as you're going up, you're going to realize that one thing always happens. Your spirit shards are going to get nuked. You're going to have some, a lot of mats, but not enough of others. And you're forced to work with people. And I think that's the design of the game is to get people to cooperate with each other, right? Guilds and commanders can play that function to bring to bridge that gap. And that's a powerful tool, right? But where the system goes, right? for the small players and all that stuff is ultimately that if this is the battle of spirit shards this is going to reinitiate the guild wars right because back in year one and year two world v world and eventually when the reigns was passed to me on maguma it was all about spirit shards and that mean, meant it was an arms race against other servers uh and you had to have guilds you have to have fighters you have to do whatever it takes to win because if you lose and you lose a fight or you lose a keep there goes your spirit shard bankman right there Right. What, how so? Do you yeah. mean because the events you can't just get? What do you mean? So um, let's say for uh, we're gonna go into world v world real quick, right? But if you um, notice that most guilds who transfer uh, servers are traditionally backed by internally by their own funding, or they ask for server leaders for some funding to cover transfer costs. But the server leader who is managing the server who is designed to accumulate wealth in certain ways or another for me for example with spirit shards i had to have the best fighters because if bg let's say blackgate or jq or something like guild ms crew were to crush me on the field all the farmers i have out there that's actually playing world v world will not be able to capture objectives or kill players for wexp to rank up to the toma knowledge right so losing is not an option oh, for see, someone okay. like me yeah so it becomes an arms race the sustainability of these of the meta right now makes it too apparent that certain guilds can maintain upwards of 90 percent win rate on the field right which pretty much uh clobber it makes it, it turns world v world into meat grinder for new commanders and all that stuff to come in because of the that that made it irrational for me to invest in that right and that's why i had to pull out of world v world right okay over time 
and uh, that ended the arms race. And now, who's taking over right now? If fight kills, if they have nothing to kill, they're going to die out one way or another, right? But who's taking over? If you look at certain guilds like Kazo, Rise, and all that stuff, these are uh, guilds that said, hey, you know what? We can still do something. I know we're, gonna, uh, we're going to do the best we can, so we're going to comp up and do everything these new guilds are coming up and replacing that fight guild era now they're not going to be like they're not going to be like red guard or you know like you know those guilds that almost wins every fight no matter what but uh they bring a challenge to the game and that causes a, a somewhat of an arms race but when alliances come out we're going to put everything we got into that because in, at the end of the day ultimately how this manifests especially for the rich people is that world v world is our gambling opportunity if your team wins, you reap the benefits of all the riches and rewards that Worldly World will Sorry, provide I, I, you, right? Am I missing a fundamental piece of information here? And that's that World mm -hmm. versus World is one of the best places for spirit shards. Is that what you're telling me? And thus, gambling on the winners of World versus World is going to be really important once alliances come in. I love the idea of that, but is that what you're telling me? That it's actually one of the best places? Yeah, I mean, uh, MM, how do you uh, do deals with commanders on yours? Yeah, so... Pretty much, I'll give you an example of why spirit shards are important. There is so, say you have a guild that has you know 10 15 people they want to transfer, right? And let's just assume that it costs about maybe one or two weapons, let's just say 4,000 gold. Um, I give that, I give those two weapons to the commander, commander you know transfers his people over. Now, how, how can a commander pay back? Now, most servers uh, did not really, you know, they pulled their war chest expecting that the return from the guild is actually based on their output in the battlefield which is the most you know biggest extent of it right i did things in a way where i i would like a gain on my investment right why would i give someone the gold if they want to make my server great that's great but at the same time how can i benefit how can they benefit as well even further so commanders who are farming and you know they're playing w dub and they're racking all these tomes of knowledge uh, and you know you make sure you have to equip them with the right tools so that they're you know making all this money right you want to give them the siege the food all that comes with the costs of bringing them over you got to make sure they're well equipped to take on the the, the next server right and when you do this uh, and you tell them hey how would li you like to be paid back for your two weapons well i have a lot of materials i need converting right well how many spirit shards is that going to take okay that's that's what it is percent you know you have 10 15 members now dedicated who have all you know they all have a, a loan they, they know they're a part of. They'll pay you back slowly through deals. Now, any extra gift of masteries, uh, usually the guild leader or the commanders will give that to you for free. You don't pay them the 500 gold fee, right? It has to pay back the investment you gave. And and that that's fine because the difference in that is some of the members, you'll still give them the 500 gold for the gift of mastery. You'll, you'll, you, know, you don't want to uh, take advantage to the point where they don't even make money off the deal, right? The commander, the guild leader will pay you back without having asking for you know their payment for the gift of mastery spirit shards now the members now have access to someone who can give them cap the member comes to me commander's like hey mm i'll refer to you 10 gift of masteries right now those 10 gift of masteries i take those 10 make 10 weapons they get their payment but those 10 weapons pay for the two weapons over time that i gave them in the first place right mm -hmm. Because I'm going to use those weapons for other deals. Maybe not specifically w -dub, just other deals like I'll go exchange it for some high-value materials, which will further make me more weapons. Or I'll put them in an infusion, and then I'll liquidate that infusion for Mystic Coins. That Those Mystic Coins will give me more access to more weapons to make. And over time, you see that as the guilds are paying you back, and in some cases, you're still going to give them a payment for some of the deals. You're, you've created the connection. You've created loyalty. And now you've just boosted your return. You got paid your entire loan back and whatever interests that you dictate on the deal and the terms with them is up to you and them. And at the same time, you've boosted the value of that guild. So now that guild is worth more than when they came into the server. What happens if you're uh, a commander with 50 of your guys capturing a keep, right? How much spear shards does that produce? Yeah, that because grand? Guild Wars has this fundamental thing where if, uh, you can have 100 people hit one mob and they'll all get experience from it, right? So you actually generate more stuff just from that kind of big zerging. So are you looking forward to the Alliance update then? Just because of how big TP barons and people like you are going to be able to essentially like gamble on, you know, the success of various alliances as they form? Or are you cynical that this will actually help your... We, uh, 
over time, uh, I am not afraid to say this, but we need power hungry commanders, I think, in this system of this uh, magnitude. Uh, commanders and guild leaders will play an, an, an incredible, increasingly, uh, inc I cannot emphasize how important it is when the Alliance system comes out that commanders have to recalibrate their guilds to function economically and bloodlust. If they lack one or the other, the guild will fail in worldly world. But when we go into alliances, we're really we're willing to drop the money down to make a very good uh, next few years for a worldly world, as long as there's commanders and guilds willing enough to take up that banner. So you will back people with capital as long as they go and fight and generate XP, essentially. Okay, so I asked the question again, is there any uh, big areas that you want people to know about as uh going forwards well there's many areas i can't i i, I wish I, I feel like i want to give the whole thing out i just it's really difficult there, there's some things you know that again a lot of this comes with experience as well you know what we say you know you have to apply it for yourself and see what works best right um and i want to get in just briefly touching on those areas and like we said, if you don't have capital, for example, to make your gift of mastery into a weapon yourself, you know, there's that method of selling it to a, a buyer. Of course, if you want the most vouched for buyers, uh, obviously there's people like me and then there's the actual exchange who there's a lot of credible buyers that can help you out. Uh, and one thing I would just want to stress is that you don't have to worry about losing the big profits on now right away, right? If you can't make that weapon, and you know that the best method is or the fastest way for you to gain capital is selling that gift of mastery, you know, go for it, right? This is just a temporary step. No one is telling you you're going to be selling gift of masteries the entire rest of your game as money making, you know, but it, you need to do that first step to advance you to the next step, right? And that might be having a lot of conversions, getting a lot of gold paid for those conversions. Um, that might be uh, rate selling. Mm -hmm. Rate selling, that might be, uh, what's it called, uh, gift of mastery uh, uh, crafting, right? Make, selling them to someone and then using that capital to start your own process. Different methods, right? It could be you are just someone who loves to farm and you have, you know, you put in a very good amount of hours every week on the farming. Just knowing, instead of selling them to the, to the buyer, or just, just, you know, understand how can I turn these materials into something, right? How can I turn all of this into something valuable and what can I gain out of it? You just realize it's what I have, what do I trade it for to get me something else? Okay. Multiple avenues I just explained, either through crafting the weapon, selling the gift of mastery, through uh, farming up the spirit shards or farming up the T5, bundling things into a package or rate selling, you know, different avenues of money making and they all have one thing in common, you're just playing the game. Yeah, yeah, they absolutely are. Is there any, like, so we're, we're about two hours in now. I'm wondering if you guys have any, like, concluding remarks or anything you really, you just think is, is there's a whole, you know, a horizon of things that we haven't actually established yet that you really want to be out there. Any thoughts? Learn learn everything about the game as you can, right? The boot builds that Boots and Wooden Potatoes puts out is incredible. Pair that up with the commander tag, and you can take on uh, events that you should be doing with like 25 30 people down to like five people right you know hot puf everything you've got to understand that it requires your initiative to actually play the game and enjoy it the single greatest in uh, investment you can make is probably commander tag in a few people with strong builds you can go into anything you want and you can clobber these game modes and make rich uh, make off with all the riches only if you have the willpower to do it I just, I think one thing we probably didn't touch on uh, only because, you know, again, we're talking about our money making methods, um, which to the player base, this is achievable by anyone. But one thing that I definitely would like people to understand is TP flipping as a whole. If you can uh, stomach the interest in that, uh, I would suggest if you're interested only to dabble in that a little bit. TP flipping is its own money making, uh, you know, method that, you know, we. We don't cover it, or we, the reason we haven't covered it in this video is because, you know, we're, we, this whole purpose of this is just showing you how we've made our wealth our way, right? Yeah, but this it, is, it, let me just say, this is really interesting because my impression all these years is to get really wealthy is to TP flip. That's what yeah. my impression was. But what I'm hearing from you is that, no, actually, TP flipping is not the full story. It's not all, and TP flipping is like this gambly kind of scary thing to some people, but it's not the full story anymore, actually. You're telling me that it's more about direct service trades between players 
and monetizing things that people aren't, right? And that's very, very heartening to hear. That's super cool. That's very much. You're putting a value on your asset, right? What's my asset value? What's the other party wants to value it? Now, the trading post, um, for a long time, the trading post was the money-making method, actually, per hour. Um, and that was only at the start of the game. And the reason why it's uh, gone less than that now nowadays is, you know, pretty much like I said, like there's a way the game can expand, and it's just literally this. The, the expansion of this game is going to be from guilds conducting trades with each other, guilds coming in with each other, and all of that, right? Um, players directly being involved together in the community. Um, now, TP flipping, there's things I would uh, say, at least on the just to broadly touch it. If you are in that area, and if that's something that interests you, check out some of the guides that the Economy Discord, it's called the Tarkaran's uh, Script Hole. Uh, that Discord is basically the unofficial economy Discord, uh, and I'm sure you can find a link on the Guild Wars 2 uh, Exchange Reddit. Um, and take a look at those guys. There's guys that show you basically what long-term speculation is, and they define them. And I would say those are the best guides you can go to there, because those are the most credible uh, barons out there. Um, and they don't tell you what to invest in specifically in those guys. Those guys just show you the methods that you can use to invest in the items you invest. And that can include uh, things like uh, high uh, velocity flipping, which in entails buying up a lot of things uh, and then repricing them, you know, you know, buy them here at this level. And then later during the week or the day, you will reprice them all and make your big profit, right? And that includes opening up as far as maybe 20, 30 plus tabs of graphs of items that you could check and see which is worth your time to take the gamble on right it, 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 that's the type of game mode that you're playing there so like you're putting in five hours in this type of money making that we were just discussing this podcast or stream there's that five hours that you'll put in on the trading post that will net you your your return now that is definitely the afk money making method if you were to talk about real afking and making money mm. um just realize you're obviously capped on based on how much liquidity you have on you and that and you're relying solely on on the trading post to make your profit, right? So you have to also take into account your profit with the tax, right? You take into account the 15% tax because that's where you're eventually going to be liquidating things. Um, and one thing I stress about when you're watching these guides uh, and you're asking questions in the, in the economy channel, you know, no one's going to give you the right, you know, items to invest in. That's on you to figure out, right? It's the same way how we didn't give you a value of the spirit charts in our money making because that's on you to figure out what's worth your time once we figured out in two years that was the value that we put in that's worth our time and that everyone in our community and attached to us understands that you have to do the same and that's also the trading post you know all that has value on it mm -hmm. and you know if, if you're someone who can make a spreadsheet you know that actually would help you as well that that, that is another way for you to open up money making method um and expand your horizon and if you're asking about a liquidity, how much do I need to start? You can start with 100 gold. I've actually That's been, I've been really happy that the whole way, I haven't heard the word spreadsheet until now, right? It's just a side. Yeah. I've been really happy because I think there's a lot of people like me and we just think we're not all about that, you know? And there's this weird impression that unless you do spreadsheets and stuff, you can't make money, but that's just not true as I now learn. So that's awesome. I can, uh, do you mind if I talk about our TP overflow? Uh, if it's on on the the topic yeah i mean absolutely tp overflow what's that so um that's a discord of uh, it's like an um offshoot of our main discord that we're currently in right now but the tp overflow acts as a place where farming community can get together there's also other farming communities like x days um dragonfall community and uh farm community also starting up again there's excellent places where people can get together it's like going to a coffee shop and share ideas and i don't mind sharing my methods of money making but people need to take time to just go out and do you know to come out and research and all that stuff uh, i'm willing to bet like 90 percent of your entire player base doesn't even understand how lucrative ls4 farming is especially the meta train right yeah i've never actually participated in it myself i've certainly not, not done any videos yeah. on it. Uh, what i did was we synchronized all the events of all six maps and we go from start to finish on all of it you know pala mala so so master, you do a bit of this stand bit of sand swept a bit of corner and so on and so on mm -hmm. It's a two and a half hour farm uh, can get you, you know, all the primary components for your legendary weapons very fast. But that's like, you know, L4 is strong in that area, but Silver Waste and other stuff are strong in other areas. But the problem is, is too many people are in one spot and not 
getting out of their little comfort zone, right? And that's why I say that if you want to get ahead in the game, you got to get out there and explore, right? And meeting some people and gaining the confidence of information is a good start, but it's all about experience. You got to be out there. You got to study what's going on with the math system and all that stuff. It's all essential. Okay. And LS5 is going to provide us another opportunity of that. That's the challenge I'm willing to go into in LS5. So you're excited. So you're looking at Season 4 just came out, and it was really lucrative mm -hmm. for people who wanted money and who look at the game and understand mm -hmm. that. And so why wouldn't Season 5 also come with its own opportunities? So your advice is for people to look out through Icebrood Saga and just try to have that own agency to figure out what opportunities there will be. And you're confident there will be some. Yeah, commanders need to be more creative than just being stuck in one map. They got to look at the whole thing and they got to string it all together. And that's how you uh, obtain what you really want, right? And I felt in the LS4 train, I'm, I'm quite sure there's a lot of some commanders. I know a lot of commanders myself that kind of went with me on this, but I felt like really alone just enjoying the richness of LS4 and no one else was uh, um, leading runs or actually, you know, attempting to string together a farm run that kind of, you know, takes it to the next level. It's kind of disappointing um, when there's not enough players who can see that and hence why we're here. We're trying to show people there's something greater than Silver Waste, right? So, so <laughs> uh, are you frustrated right. at people saying, oh, the corner farm isn't very good, Gandara's rubbish? Does that frustrate you because you actually see a lot of profit in it and a lot of value there? Same with dungeons and stuff? Uh so you you have to keep in mind that the maps are designed deliberately for a start and an end point because inevitably people have to move on past these maps right mm. and you can look at vision as one of those examples right you know the the trinket and sky skill is part of vision right you know for because you have to complete achievements and all that stuff and that means that um it goes beyond gold at this point it goes into map currencies right you have to have everything in order to build this it's a long journey and all that stuff and by the time you make vision you just i don't people think they realize that they've also farmed at least five or seven legendary weapons on the side with that yeah. right and the thing is is that that requires consistency and uh per, i'd say i've always said the commander's greed is really good if a commander is uh right there trying to say hey i want to finish vision right that means that they got to farm all the maps. What can Commander do with 20 people? They can clobber every meta, harvest that, help new people, you know, get their achievements and all that stuff done and things like that. When you look at LS4 and actually take a very careful look at it, the design of LS4 is beautiful, right? But you need some people who can see this. And I hope that more and more people will realize that, you know, as a Commander or a person who is wanting to get ahead in this game you have to step up and see these things and sort and formulate a plan to and execute it it's that simple to get ahead in this okay. game i just want to iterate that like you know, this is just to take the ls4 meta train for example you know like we spent like zushin and a lot of other commanders who command with us um you know they spent months and months like once this town got nerfed and you remember when the outrage of people in the community saying oh they nerfed this town um and let's be honest, uh, better part, you know, that's what's needed to advance the economy because the longer the materials fell in price, you know, the longer that we would have actually have seen our assets go down, right? It's just a natural evolution to the market. But, you know, going back on commanding, you know, it didn't take us, you know, one day to figure out, oh, well, they nerfed this down, we're going to go on the LS4 meta chain. No, we took weeks and weeks of perfecting which certain metas in that train should we even like cover in the train, right? And, and it went from, a farm or an event where it would take us from start to finish four or five hours and we narrowed it down where now you know we have it in our routine if people are interested in during the day we have it from start to finish about three hours now to do it right and it, it took a lot of perfection to understand which matters meant better for us and which right. didn't more importantly every farm i do i always give a lecture out because farmers need to know what they're farming right Every time I give a lecture out, and I, I'm quite sure I've touched a lot of people in the Ellis Fork farming community, every single person who has actually listened to that lecture and has actually been part of our community and stuff like that, every single one of them has successfully went over fifteen to 20,000 gold account value, right? Both gold and liquid mats. 
they're able to make legendary with no problem because they un fundamentally understand what the maps are about and that's the challenge of guild wars 2 people need to understand that there's more to this game i mean no offense but you know lore is one thing but the game design and the beauty of it is another yeah. and that it, we have to look it's at more than just salvage all deposit it's more than that yeah. uh do you want this overflow that you talked about do you want that linked in this video or do you want people to have the initiative to look at their own stuff and you know maybe only outreach later we're, we're open i mean it's a public discord if anyone wants to reach us uh you, you can just feel free to come in like even if we're on discord you know don't be shy come in say hi all right well i'll, I'll, leave, a, I'll leave a link in the description of this video so people as they close out of this now if they're feeling really energized and they want to find things out they get in game uh they they have that there if that's yeah, good to you guys yeah. well so if that's all the major topics i think uh we'll call it there i'm sure uh everyone's got stuff to do uh it's been really really opening guys I've done, I've done a lot of cool things i really like the sound of actually how the game is structured at the moment and it's uh it's not what i thought it was at all so this has been really really cool to hear genuinely um so thank you all for the information and uh, you're more than welcome to join us anytime yeah i mean i'm wondering now i really am i mean i have so many spirit shards i have so oh, i'll much buy it all up it's crazy man <laughs> i just don't know whether i want to do the clicking i guess i'll see how it feels um but thank you uh it's been brilliant and uh hopefully everyone's feeling good uh drop in the comments any feedback you have for these guys i'm sure they'll be looking seeing your responses uh, any questions anything that wasn't truly cleared up maybe i didn't ask the right questions and uh let us all know what you think so Cheers and um, good luck out there, everyone. Thanks very much. A Kimmy in chat. Were you not going to talk about raids and stuff? You, you're, you're all right. Uh, I can if you want me to. Well, I mean, if we're done, I, it, it has been a long time. If you're really desperate to talk about it, then yeah, I mean, we could. But I, I just didn't want you to feel left out. Or I mean, well, I mean, a lot of the trades that I do, uh, like Wazushin and MM and Red, like they all, they're all more in touch with the bottom, like, like there's the ninety percent of the players. Wazushin does lots of the farms and stuff. I, I, I go there seldomly. I do right, but I don't have to as much because, as I think MM touched on it briefly. Uh, a lot of the stuff you get from raids telling the coins the stuff you can use and you could supplement it to other various uh forms of of uh like trading and using that to buy your spirit shards so or to trade up and to make more profit off of it so a lot of that stuff was already really covered okay all right that's perfectly fair well uh as long as people know that that stuff's available and i hope that people do think a bit more deeply about this by the way one thing i was thinking of like i hope that i don't want to mention this in the video really because i want people to think but you guys inspired me to think of like doesn't um ju uh dueling have transmogrification of like orbs right like there's a way of tearing stuff up on that right that's a thing I've never really thought about. Is that are those like untapped economies? Yeah. So if you look at LS4, is? the primary mob that we kill is Brand, right? So you know the incandescent dust that f directly fuels into the amalgamated gemstone production by buying low tier jewels and promoting them with. Ah, uh, that's interesting. What about um, like all the trade contracts and stuff, and all the all those extremely things? Extremely important. Just... As your map completing POF and all that stuff for that XP, you need to complete. You need those contracts to complete the achievements to out, uh, increase your output by the end of the map comp. I see. This whole achievement thing's so crazy to me.